Well, number one, we are at war. 2020, the entire United States is at war between good and evil. California has been out of control and San Francisco is no differences. Welcome to Chinatown 2.0. We are an interview podcast where we explore the stories, ideas, and actions of global citizens with Chinese heritage. I'm your host, Richard Yan. Today, I speak with Ellen Li Zhao, or Li Ai Chen, or Lei Ai Sun in Cantonese, a two-time candidate for San Francisco mayor in 2018 and 2019. She ran as a conservative in a city where the mayor had been a Democrat for the last half a century. On top of her non-mainstream political ideologies, she had zero experience holding public office and raised very little money compared to her competition. Despite all this, she won 4% of the votes in 2018 and 13% votes in 2019. And in 2019, she came in second. Ellen is a staunch supporter for President Donald Trump, as will be obvious to those of you watching the video version of the interview. We discussed her experience running for the mayor of San Francisco. We also talked about issues in San Francisco, such as homelessness, drugs, crime, high property prices, deteriorating standards in public education, government corruption, voter fraud, and more. For most of these items, Ellen discussed her solutions. We also briefly touched upon Ellen's day job as a behavioral health clinician, where she works with doctors and nurses to treat the mentally ill. Lastly, Ellen talked about her circumstances when she first immigrated to the U.S. as a teenager from China some 30 years ago. As usual, don't forget to like, subscribe, and ring the bell on our YouTube channel. I hope you enjoyed this interview. Hi, Ellen. How's it going? Welcome to our show, Chinatown 2.0. Well, thank you, Richard. So, Ellen, one thing that I know of your background that's been really interesting to me is that you previously ran for mayor in the city of San Francisco. And to my knowledge, you are one of the few first-generation Chinese Americans to ever run for the position of mayor of a major city. And on top of that, you are a conservative running for the mayor of a fairly blue city, to say the least. So that's a really fascinating experience to me. You must have some very interesting stories to tell there. I'd love to hear about that experience. If you could just walk us through why you did it, how you did it, what was the outcome, what you learned from it, would you do it again, and so on. Well, that's a very good question. You're right. I am a first generation. I am an immigrant. I was born and raised in a farm in Taishan, Canton, China. I came here when I was in high school. So I had my high school education and my college in America. So I am bilingual, by culture, And I- But you're trilingual, uh, right? You speak Mandarin and Cantonese. I actually speak four languages. Oh, which is the fourth one? Well, I was born and raised in Toisan. So I speak oh, Toisanese. I see. And then I watch TV, learn Cantonese. And I also watch TV, learn Mandarin. And I came to America and learned English. So what language do you speak at home to your family members? Cantonese and English. Cool, cool. Yeah, go ahead. So in my situation, it was pretty unique. I have never thought about running for mayor. I have never thought about running for office. Right. I right. was nominated by San Francisco Coalition for Good Neighborhoods. It's a group of people from all 11 districts. San Francisco had 11 districts. And we have a lot of people back then in 2017, we were fighting for no recreational cannabis in the Asian neighborhoods, a lot of them Chinese neighborhoods. And we were fighting in public hearing against it. I was pretty outspoken doing public hearing. I was the interpreter for a lot of uh, non-English speaking people in public hearing. So in 2017, for almost 10 months, we were fighting inside city hall for no recreational cannabis. Can I get some clarification there? Because I understand that in California, the use of recreational marijuana has already been approved by the state, right? It's already legal. So what are you fighting against? 2016, the recreational cannabis law was passed. So it takes about a year to implement. 2017, each city or each county tried to 
implement what is a better uh, regulation for the local people. So San Francisco tried to implement elusive regulation to comply for the recreational cannabis law. Unfortunately, many of the Chinese people, you all know San Francisco has about 35% Asian people and the majority of Asian immigrants and Asian families, we do not want recreational cannabis next to preschool, next to middle school, next to high school, next to any school or next to any neighborhood, any neighborhoods, including stores, and churches. So when they were fighting in City Hall, you understand San Francisco back then in 2016, they already had 55 recreational cannabis stores already. And when they wanted to open up for recreational cannabis, they wanted to open approximately 400 stores in addition to the 55 medical uh, recreation already. So, okay. you know, after the recreation uh, legislation passed in December 2017, the mayor signed the legislation in December 6, 2017. Six days later, the mayor, Ed Lee, passed away from a heart attack. And four days later, after he passed away, there was an announcement that there will be a new mayor run. Right. To replace it's a special him. election. Yes. And so people recognized my voice when I was fighting inside City Hall in the public hearing. So I got a lot of people came to me and teased at me. Why don't you run for mayor? I said, hell no. I said, these people in City Hall, they'll eat me alive. Well, I thought about what they said. You know, they kind of look, if you wanted to run it, run it for conservative, run it for immigrant, run it for parents. For 10 months of recreational fighting inside City Hall, you stood up, you talk about what is good, what is not right. Just use what you have going through and run for mayor. So I said, give me some time to think about it. So after a few days prayer, I pray. And I thought about my situation. I thought about what we're going through. So I said, okay, I accepted the nomination. And so I ran for mayor, that's it. Okay, great. I have so many follow-up questions on that. Running for any office, especially as a conservative in a liberal hmm. politician dominated city, is taxing not only for the individual, but possibly for the family as well. What is your family's reaction to your decision to run for mayor of San Francisco? When I talk to my kids, my husband, my family, they all laugh. <laughs> we just like, Why? wow, yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> well, first of all, they'll say, well, you don't have money. You don't have experience. You know that you're not going to win. Well, I, I, I took it as a feedback and I told them sometimes you do something it's not about the result when I first ran in 2018 nine people ran for mayor there's only one winners just because the result might not be a winner it doesn't mean that you're going to stop the race so I, I took it as compliment when people give me a lot of hard time <laughs> yeah I took okay. it as compliments yes so tell us a little bit about the process running for mayor because you've run twice now once in a special election, once in the regular election, right? Maybe tell us about both times. Well, in 2018, after Mayor Eddie passed away four days, there's a, a file for paperwork. So I went to the election office and asked them and they asked me to prepare for the payment and it's $6,700 application free uh, as a mayor candidate. I go, wow, really $6,700 to run for mayor? Well, because the mayor get about $350,000 a year plus Finch benefits. You talk about in salary. You talk about the highest about, paying mayor in the States, I believe. Yes. It's close to about half a million dollars a year. Salary yes. plus benefits. By the way, I understand that one of your positions is to slash the mayor's salary in half once you become yes. the mayor. Yes. So I can completely understand that position. But do you plan for that for your staff as well? If I am a mayor, I will not create the mayor's office the way the current mayor create right. the mayor's office. To me, I'm sorry that I have to say it. To me, it's a bunch of cheaters and liars took over city hall and create a phony office. And it's not helping the people in San Francisco. And look at how much they make. There's a lot of people make more than $200,000 a year in the mayor's office team. And what do they do? 
more people die on the street. Because compared to before, there's a lot more people pass away on the street right. than before at least, before the last mayor passed away. I actually think that, first of all, when a city is run like this, there is a need for someone outside the political sphere to challenge the incumbents. And I also don't think that the chance for a outsider to win is that low. Just think about what has happened in our country recently in at various levels of the government in terms of electoral process. So I actually think that there must be a segment of the population that are very enthusiastic about your run and your platform. Can you- uh, Yes, yes, talk, yes. Yeah, can you talk a little bit about the kind of surprises, pleasant surprises or maybe unpleasant surprises you've encountered after you started running for mayor in both years? Well, the first year of 2018, it was very special. I've never had any experience. And because I am a government employee, I was able to ask a lot of co-workers and the people who work at the election office. I asked them for help. And along the way, I just learned that I received so much compliments admire me with nothing and <laughs> and trying to run for mayor. <laughs> In fact, 2018, I've joined quite a number of debates with other career politicians. They're already in office or they are retired from office. And to me as a you know immigrant and a people of color, and they look down on me, laugh at me and giving me a lot of hard time, but I took it as compliments. I thank people for giving me a hard time. I thank them for giving me middle fingers. I thank them for telling me to go back to China and I bless their heart. And I've been through a lot of stuff, but 2019 is a little different. 2019, because I have the first time experienced. So I developed a bigger team, a stronger team about our which about tactics to nail down what the problems are. So we develop a lot of videos for campaigning. At the same time, we have more people doing a lot of volunteer work and outreach to people in the community. Of course, I also was harassed by the democratic leaders. Could you elaborate on the harassment? What kind of harassment yes. did you receive? For example, 2019, in October, I put up quite a number of billboards and a lot of posters out in different neighborhoods. I've seen them, yeah. And to my knowledge, the electoral officials, board of supervisors, and the mayor, and the mayor's campaigning team manager, they put out a press release calling me racist, calling me that I have no political course at City Hall, and calling me names and telling me because I am a Trump supporter that I'm not welcome in San Francisco. And in fact, I have quite a number of government employees who are my friends before telling me to go to hell because I supported Trump and because I came out strong against corruption at City Hall because Landon Breed, the current mayor, it's African-American. And I have quite a number of coworkers who are African-American who gave me a lot of middle fingers, calling me names and tell me to go to hell, go back to China, and I don't belong there. And whew, the whole night, yeah, I just thanked them. I said, thank you very much. You know, when people calling people names, it's because I came out to run for mayor as a conservative. I look at these people that I felt sorry for them, that they are so hateful just because I call out saving the homeless. I call out stop corruption at City Hall. I call out nobody should be eating garbage on the street. I call out nobody should be passing away on the street, but I cause a lot of controversial attention. Yeah. I did not know there are seven parties until I run for mayor in 2018. Right. I said, no wonder that we the people in San Francisco so out of control because of one party, Democrats only for 45 years. And I call them, this party is demonic. Okay. The Democratic Party dominated San Francisco City Hall for more than 45 years, no other party, but 100% Democrats only. So I call them people pretty evil, fail to stop people dying on the street. Let's take one problem at a time, right? San Francisco is full of issues. Let's take yes. homelessness 
as a problem. And one problem with homelessness is that they create not only nuisance, but also drug problems. So what would be your solution that is humane and reasonable to help fight this problem? Well, first of all, you got to understand San Francisco, it's very liberal. The demonic politician in City Hall, they are supporting illegal drugs by giving needles free, five million a year, and, and the people collecting less than half of these needles back. So the other half, maybe going to the bay, you know, maybe going to the garbage, maybe, maybe on the street. How can I solve the homeless problem? First of all, San Francisco, the politicians, the demonic politicians who behind the pay and play parties, they do not want to end homeless, period. Mark my words. I work for the government for long enough and see how they corrupt the money and see how they do not want to end homeless. But, but how does they that don't... help them stay in power? How does that help anybody if they don't resolve this problem? If the government spend 1.5 billion a year on homeless, and we only have 35,000 homeless, if you calculate the total amount of billions of dollars and divide it by the number of homeless, the minimum homeless person costs about $3,900 minimum, up to $17,000 a homeless, a month, a month, okay? But where's the money? But if you think about this, if I have the money for 30, let's say $3,000 a homeless, right? I can send this homeless. Well, why don't you go to Sacramento? Why don't you go to other states? I can pay you a thousand dollars. With the amount of money that we have, we should not be seeing homeless people eating garbage, dying on the street because the money is corrupted by the demonic politician who are colluded, related to homeless business. Homeless is a business for politician and homeless is a business for politician related families, relatives, friends. Now, I personally don't say it from my mouth, don't call me on it. I read it from the news. I read it from documentaries. Right. And that's why I get all the information. We used to have 2000 homeless in 2008. 10 years later, 2018, we had about 20,000 homeless. And then 2019 last year, we had about 33,000 homeless. This year, 2020, because of the pandemic, I believe that we are surpassed right now 40,000 homeless people. Because many of the homeless people, I'm talking to you in plain language, 60% of the homeless people are not from San Francisco. They are attracted by the demonic Korea politicians, Democratic Party, use the number of homeless from other cities, they continue to develop failing policies. So in order to answer your question, if I am a mayor, what can I do to end homeless? First of all, we have to work with the state level and the federal level because each time when San Francisco house some homeless, then more other non-San Francisco homeless will come. So no matter what we do, San Francisco, the way they handle homeless will never end homeless problem. When because- you say, When you say the, sorry, when you say the government houses the homeless, you mean provide shelter for them? Well, when I say house means they provide shelter, they provide long-term housing, they provide Medicare, they provide temporary shelter, it depends what kind of uh, services uh, a homeless prefer. So right now, if I'm a homeless person and I want shelter from city of San Francisco, what is the process of getting that housing and how long am I entitled to it? If I am from our state, I came to San Francisco and then I go to a, a clinic or shelter. I said, look, I'm new in San Francisco. I want housing. So yeah. they will put you on a shelter rate list. Yeah. And it takes anywhere up to about six months to get shelter, not housing. And okay. from shelter, then you might have a chance for permanent housing. It depends on your status. If you're a veteran, if you're disabled, if you have children, if you're single women, a single um, man, 
or if you're a couple, if you're a family, it really depends. It takes anywhere up to five years or even up to 10 years for, I'm talking about permanent, okay? Permanent housing. Yeah. So each night in San Francisco, if I remember correctly, approximately 4,000 people will be sheltered overnight. Shelter means you have an indoor place to sleep. Okay. Now, let's say I come in and say, look, uh, I'm sorry, the shelter is full. We don't have anything. And then they will ask you if you have any relatives or any place you go or anybody you know. And if not, they say, well, I'm sorry, we don't have it. And then people will end it up on the street. Okay. So that's the process. So I interrupted you. You were talking about your plan to help transition from the homelessness problem. So go ahead. I said, if I become a mayor, the homeless problem will be local level, state level, and the federal level. San Francisco alone will not be able to stop any homeless problems at all. No matter who the mayor is, if they said they can solve the homeless problem, that is a lie. A lie. I am a government employee. I am a social worker. I am a provider to people who needed shelter and homeless. And we work with people, my coworkers work with people to shelter people. And we have approximately 35,000 government employees. I work with many government employees and provide services to homeless, you know, including nurse and doctors. We know no matter what we do in San Francisco, homeless problem, it's an ongoing problem unless we stop housing non-San Francisco homeless. And if they come, we will build them from the city where they come from. That's one way to do. Number two, work with the state level, Gavin Newsom, the, the governor, the current governor, because in San Francisco right now, approximately the new set, we had about 160,000 homeless. I personally believe California has more than 200,000 active homeless people. 200,000 already? 200,000 homeless people throughout California. Did you oh, hear this when California. I said? Okay. Yes. So you think about it. If San Francisco can house, let's say 500 homeless in three months, so if we can house 2,000 homeless a year, but California had 200,000 homeless. So no matter what we do, San Francisco will not able to end homeless in San Francisco because we know that already I am a government employee. We work with homeless, we talk with homeless, and we know that 60% of the people, they are not from San Francisco. They are attracted by the Finch benefits, the welfare benefits, and everything free. They came here for a purpose of welfare and free housing, free hotel, free motel, free drugs, and the liberal, the evil demonic politician in City Hall continue to use the number so they can allocate the money, so to speak, for the homeless. But the homeless themselves, they do not get the money it was allocated. That's why yeah. the homeless problem will not end in this administration as long as Democrats running city hall demonically with the, the policy that we are facing. So when I become a mayor, I will declare crisis, emergency, evacuation for all homeless off the street, clean them all and work with them with the state and federal and have military style bungalows and big shelters, temporary shelters, and to check them out, do health screening, ask them what kind of ability they have, what can they do and what kind of disability they have. And we know that 15% of the homeless people, they're working people, they work full-time or part-time and then they're on and off you know, homeless because they don't have enough money. And 60% of the homeless people they need treatment on drugs, illegal drugs, mental health problems. So you're talking about 75 already. The other approximately 5% of the people, they absolutely, absolutely needed 24 seven shelter care, which means they are severely mentally incapable for living a life on their own. 
So you have 80% of the people off the street. The other 20%, we call them career professional homeless. That's what they do for a living. They come to San Francisco, they get the welfare they want, and then they have a free ticket. You, do you know that San Francisco given free tickets for anyone who wanted to travel from San Francisco anywhere in the United States? Free so for plane example, ticket? Free plane tickets, bus tickets, and on top of them, they give you cash on the way traveling and so you can buy food. So for example, if I am from Hawaii, right? Yeah. And in Hawaii, you know, you get a ticket from Hawaii social worker. They say, oh, I don't like Hawaii anymore. I want to go to San Francisco. The social worker in there will provide them a ticket to come to San Francisco. Now they come here for a few months. Oh, they didn't like that. They go to the social worker. Look, I don't want San Francisco anymore. I want to go back to Hawaii. And then, so the social worker will provide them a free ticket. So they go back to Hawaii. So we have quite a number of them, a lot of them. We call them, no matter what we do, they are called professional homeless people. They abuse the system by getting free tickets, free foods, and continue some of them selling drugs and selling other stuff on the street for a living. You know, they do it as a business. So if I am a mayor, that's my plan. Declare emergency crisis, clear them all from the street and have them group in different evaluation places and set them up and group them for severely mentally ill people. They will be housed 24 seven with doctors and nurse and treat them like human beings. No one should be dying on the street. The other 15% people, they are working. They already have jobs, and but they are not afforded to pay um, the, the high housing you have. We will locate uh, the property owners to work with them and to work with, deal with them And because in San Francisco right now, 2020, we have more than 65,000 empty apartments in San Francisco that we can work a deal with the property owners and let them know we have people who are working, who are good people, who are homeless people, they want housing and they can work the agreement between them. And most of this working uh, homeless, they could be a worker, they could be a helper, helping the other homeless who want to go back to their life. And, and that's that's one way to start. You know, it takes a lot of manpower, but it's a, a way that we can do. Now you can look look at the other models, other countries. You know, New York before used to be have a lot of homeless people. Yeah, I was but, about but, to ask you about other cities that have done a good job with this. Yes, so yes. Go ahead. And that's, yes. that's, that's, that's exactly what they do. First of all, you have to clean, clean them up. Yeah. No homeless, it's allowed. In, on any street in San Francisco to clean them, clean them all, and and you know, but but you know the opposition will be the liberal lawyers. Oh, that's a, a civil right. That's a freedom of choice. You know, San Francisco, we have a law already. No homeless, it's allowed in San Francisco. We had a law. It's just that the demonic politician. They so you're chose saying the law the, is not being enforced. That's right. The demonic politician, they chose not to implement it. And by the way, I am going to different public hearings and all the public elected officials, they know who I am, what I'm talking about. I Yes, I call them demonic politician because they, they wouldn't care if people pass away. They wouldn't mind giving illegal drugs for them. And they wouldn't mind if people are doing prostitution just to, to get a night to sleep. Those are called yeah. demonic. That's the word I have. I, I, I call them it. evil. I call them evil. I call them demonic and they can look at my face and that's the way I talk. Of course, they call me nonsense. Yeah. Well, I, I've they, looked you up. They, some people have called you a joker. Some call you a Chinese Donald yeah. Trump. But, yes. So, so my question to you is other than the homelessness problem, what are some other major issues that you would be campaigning on in your next mayoral election? If 2021, we have a special election for mayor again. Why would we have a special election? Because of resignation? I have no idea. 2021, we might have a mayor election. Maybe a landed bridge, something happened to her. She might be resigned or she might be indicted or something that she chose not to be a mayor. And 2021, if that's what happened, I will 
file my paperwork to run for mayor again. Yeah. Now, if 2021, nothing happened, there's no special mayor run, the next mayor run will be 2023. Yeah. No, by then, I cannot tell whether I will be running or not because I am not having any plan for three years from now, okay? This year, 2020, we have a lot of corruption. We have corrupted officials has been indicted. There's eight of them indicted in San Francisco. Can you give a few examples? I'm actually not aware of the city politics. Like, what are they indicted for? Well, from the media, that we have eight people indicted for government violation, criminal activities. That's why they're indicted by the FBI. I believe it started with Lyndon Breed's ex-boyfriend, uh, Nulu, Mahama Nulu. He was public work director and he accepted bribes and he corrupted systems. I have no idea in all the details, but I learned some of it. And he plead guilty and expanded to other people. So that's why there's eight people indicted. According to what we know back in March, Landon Breed's ex-boyfriend was indicted by the FBI and investigated by the FBI. And she immediately came out and say that she accept $6,000 as a gift from her ex-boyfriend who was indicted now. And there's quite a number of people came out publicly, include a couple of supervisors, tell her to resign. And then because we have the pandemic, everything died down and she continued to be a mayor and she continued to hold the power. And we have more people dying on the street and we see more corruptions in City Hall, for example defunding the police yeah. and we have we have the crime rising up in san francisco compared to last year right so can you yeah. name two other major issues that you would be campaigning on in addition to homelessness well as a government employee and a provider to heal the homeless and get people off the street so they can back mm -hmm. to their life the other one is sex trafficking human trafficking and prostitution what it has to do with morale, which means that we layer to drug trafficking. Now, Richard, I'm not sure if you ever came to San Francisco Tenderloin. If you go to Tenderloin, you will see there's a group of teenagers between about, I would say, 15 to about 20s. The young kids, uh, boy and girls, they, they, they stand on the, the corners on different streets selling drugs. And it's controlled by, I don't know who, they have to sell drugs for a shelter. And when I become a mayor, I will be working with the uh, state level, local level, and the federal level to crack down those drug dealers and to end the drug problems in San Francisco. Right now, the drug problem, the, the, the law itself is not effective. The drug dealers continue to dominate uh, our homeless. 60% people, all the money goes to the drugs and they're mentally not healthy in a way that they're not able to go back to their normal life. So in order for me to help the homeless, we have to stop the drugs that go into their Can, can I ask you, where do the homeless people come up with the money to pay for drugs? Do they receive cash from the city? Well, according to interviews, because I spoke to a lot of people on the street. Yeah. That's part the of city, your job, right? No, it's not part of my job. Okay. I, I, I volunteer. No. Right. I shouldn't say not part of my job. I do not personally provide direct services to homeless people, my job, but I indirectly provide services to my coworkers, supportive workers, to therapists, doctors, nurses. And I do occasionally when homeless people drop in my clinic and ask for shelter and ask for stuff, I do check in with them, talk with them, and explaining uh, resources with them. Yes. Okay. But I okay. am not, I'm not like open a case and follow this person. I, I don't do that. Right, right, right. But I not do, formally. I do encounter. Right. right. But so, right so anyway, now, yes. Because, so go ahead and explain how they get the money to buy drugs. You said something about interviews. Yes. So a couple of areas. If you are homeless, you go apply at the food stamp office, the welfare office. There's a couple of areas you apply. And when you apply, it takes 30 days. San Francisco requires a 30 days residency. So if I'm from Hawaii, from New York, I come to San Francisco for welfare, I just have to stay for 30, year, 30 days. 
30 days, then I become a resident of San Francisco, then I'm entitled to GA, which is cash welfare. It's approximately 400, I believe it's 420 now, $420 a month. In addition, the minute I came from other city, I can immediately get um, food stamp, which is a, a cash card that I can use it to go to Safeway, any food place that I can spend. It's about $200 a month cash. So you think about it, if I am from another city or state coming to San Francisco, immediately I'm qualified for $200 food stamp. I can take it to buy anything that I want. That's a month? I'm talking a month. In addition, after 30 days, I'm qualified for cash A for $420, right? And I get free Medicare, Medicare depends on your age. And then I also get free housing, which means shelter. And if I don't get my housing, I will be getting my blanket or a tent. You know, you know, there's a lot of people camping on the street. Right. So, okay. So, so it sounds like they basically got the money from the GA you mentioned to yep, pay for drugs. Okay. So, so that's one way to get it. The okay. other way is that you have evil. I use the word evil. You have evil people who are controlling the drugs on the street. They ask some of the drug users, homeless people, to sell it for them so they can get drugs for free. Right. They make the Which, users distribute as well. They yes, hook them and, into, yes. into drugs and then they make them become a seller. Yes. Which I, right now, because we're in a shelter at home right now, I am working from home right now. So I don't go out to the street like I used to. See, if I go out to the street, like I would say two hour, five days or three hour, five days, I would talk to homeless people, check in with them, saying hi with them. You know, every now and then I see people not moving. I, I would call the police for paramedics. Every Saturday, it, we are shelter at home, but I go out every Saturday um, in the morning. This is, a, uh, this is my volunteer work, okay? This is not my regular job now. I work Monday to Friday. So Saturday, I would go out to the downtown area with friends that we do on and off outreach to homeless. We pray for people and we ask them if they're okay. Once in a while, we buy food for them. I speak to a lot of people on the street and I felt so sorry. Actually, and, you know, I have a quick question about carjacking. So I read some stats about how there are, I think, between 60 and 100 carjackings every day in San Francisco. So what has caused this to happen? It seemed not as bad 10 years ago. This problem has been ongoing for the last five years in San Francisco. Every day, on average, we have more than 100 car break-ins. Because the liberals, the evil politicians, the demonic politicians create the law, they will not prosecute the people, repeat offenders, and they will not follow up. So basically being soft on crime is encouraging repeat behavior. But I actually have another very important question for Chinese Americans. It's about education. First of all, does the mayor have any influence on the school board of San Francisco? Now, the reason why I ask that is in relation to some of the recent development. For example, the Lowell School is yeah. a very renowned public high school. It's like Stuyvesant of San Francisco, right? Yeah, now, it's an icon. Recently, an icon it's an San icon, Francisco. right? They yes. recently, yes. the board unanimously voted to have the admission system be lottery-based for the year of 2021 because, number one, the junior highs weren't able to get their grades together and there was no way to administer standardized tests because of COVID, right? That was the claim. And obviously some people really like this idea because they like affirmative action. They think this will give some kids a fair chance and some people really hated it, right? Because this is unfair to kids coming from un- underprivileged backgrounds that have been studying really hard in preparation. Now their chances are much, much slimmer as a result. So two questions. Number one is, what do you think of this decision? And second question is, does the mayor have influence in correcting the behavior of the board in issues like this? Well, number one, we are at war. 2020, the entire United States is at war between good and evil. California has been out of control and San Francisco is no differences. They wanted to destroy our education for equality. 
Lowell is a high school, it's an icon high school for people who are thriving, who really put their head into education. And many of the people, they work real hard to be independent in that school. It's a, yeah, it's there's a, a stat score. saying a third of the students there are actually in the lower socioeconomic echelon. Yes. So, so that's yes. a big portion of students that don't come from privilege. You can say that the majority of people are Asian people. They will not are Asians, yeah, but we don't know what kind of economic it. background they come from. No, 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 no. They will not acknowledge it right now. But mayor uh, can't do policy. anything with the school board, right? It's independent. To put my uh, understanding. Uh, no, no, no. My understanding, the mayor would talk to whoever's in charge and or go to the public hearing and then you speak your mind from the news. I believe yeah. that she have done so. So as a mayor, I believe that you do not have the power to stop what they vote, but you yeah. have the influence. You about, have soft power, right? And because, you know, the mayor have control about budgeting, about certain projects. Okay. So uh, if the mayor advocate for something and some people, they will vote according to what the mayor, you know, influence. Yeah. Right. It, does it have power? Of course, in, in somewhat way, but, but okay. not 100%. Okay. And so uh, if lower, according to the uh, lottery, it's about discrimination Correct. because you just like Proposition 16 right now, Proposition 16, they put discrimination backward. You don't have to be good to go to a school as long as you in, it, it, if I'm black, okay, I don't have to be in a, in a SAT that is meet the requirement. If I'm Chinese, I don't have to be in this way as long right. as they code it. Or five Chinese, five black, five Latino, five white, and then as long as I'm in the system and they do the lotto, then what's the point to study so hard? It's yeah. not it's not rewarding people. It, yeah. It's just um, making people stupid. Okay, I don't normally yeah. use bad words, but making people stupid and play like their god. Yeah. It's a, a to be fair though, I kind demonic. of feel that whoever is championing no on Prop 16, their argument would be a lot more powerful if they come up with an alternative to fix the problem that Prop 16 is meant to address. So Prop 16 is trying to basically equalize the society in some way, right? Because there's been systemic historical injustices on certain groups of people. So I feel that if somebody wants to say, hey, vote no on Prop 16, their argument would be a lot stronger if they say, alternatively, we should try this other system to help solve the problem. Instead of saying, you know what, every man for himself. That's a lot less persuasive in my opinion. I believe that people are misled and miseducated. Proposition 16, it's a plain discrimination. It tells people that you don't have to study hard. You do not have to be meeting the requirement as long as you are Chinese, black, white, because they're giving a quota. That is not America. America is an equal opportunity. It's like, for example, if I'm a doctor, a doctor, you have to qualify to be a doctor. You just say, well, I'm Chinese. You have to hire me, even right. I'm not qualified. And, wait a minute. Yeah, same right. thing with Lowell, same thing with Proposition 16. For all the colleges, you have to qualify to go in, period. Right. I, I get it. Okay, so maybe let's talk a little bit about your campaign tactics. Now, so... You can implement all these policies, but you have to become the mayor first, right? So election right. is extremely important. And the question I have for you is, what kind of campaign strategies do you have to win these votes? So number one, yeah. San Francisco is corrupt. When I say corrupt means, besides people are evil, demonic, pay to play, it's the same people controlling the same city hall. First of all, the election, or the election office, the voters fraud. If it is the same voting system, no conservative will win. It doesn't really matter how much money you have. But to answer your question- Hold on, do why I... do you think the voting system is against conservatives? Isn't it just a matter of one man or one woman, one vote? Yeah, ideally, Richard, ideally it's one ID, one person, one vote. In San Francisco, the way that I've seen and experienced when I was running for mayor, yeah. I found out 151 years old still in the voters' row, 136 years old still in the voters' row, 119 years old, more than 500 people still in the voters' row. And people are passing Sorry, I don't away. understand what you mean. What do you mean 119 years old, 500 people in the voters' row? What does that mean? That means people are dead. They continue able to vote. It's called oh. election you're saying these ballots are illegitimate. Exactly. It is in 
possible for anyone, I'm not talking about this conservative, for any Democrats or any other party to win outside the circle. San Francisco had the similar people inside that circle in the office, especially the mayor position. It's the same people. It's just like a family business. So in order for a conservative person like me to be the next mayor, number one, we have to address the election fraud system. Number two, people, I'm talking about all people in San Francisco. It doesn't really matter you're Democrat, Libertarian, nonpartisan, any, any party, anybody, immigrants, come out to vote in person. Because when you vote in person, the machine will take your vote as the way you are. But if you vote and mail in ballots, and especially the people in senior homes and homes from low income buildings, many of those votes either missing or they switch the votes or many of the votes the person who wanted to vote is not ending up in the intended voting. For example, they wanted to vote no on Proposition 16, it ended up, it became a yes on 16 because the voting system itself is corrupt in San Francisco. So number one, we have to clean up the San Francisco voters role for the, all the dead people, the people inactive, the people no longer in San Francisco, the homeless people no longer in San Francisco and the people no longer living in San Francisco to, qual to, to qualify to be a voter. Now for this system, we need to work with the state level and the federal level. How do we know? Because one person, one vote. For example, if you are richer, you have the same name, same birthday, same social security number. We know there's only one richer, this person. So one vote only. But in San Francisco, you can vote in San Francisco in District 1. You might go ahead and go to District 3 and vote it again. Or you vote it in San Francisco, you can go to Oakland and vote it again. Nobody knows. You know why? Because they don't ask you ID. They don't ask you who you are. You just tell them, oh, I'm Ellen. I'm from uh, ABC Street. And if you're able to name it, they say, oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, you can vote. Okay. When we know. I mean, is there know, evidence of someone clear. going around to different polls and then do you repeat voting? It's on the news. You can just Google about election fraud okay. all over. All right. So I checked the results from last time, right? In the last mayor run, you had 19% of the votes and the current mayor had, I think, 60%. So even if we were to solve for this voter fraud problem, that wouldn't close the gap of 40 points, right? Aside from solving this problem, which seems actually pretty hard to tackle to begin with, what are your other ideas? For example, do you have a good advisor, an experienced person to help guide through this process? And have you identified cohorts of the citizenry that are more likely to vote for you? Are there key influencers that you can work with that champion your message? I do not expect people all to vote for me. For me to win a race as a mayor and to be a conservative mayor to revive San Francisco, I'm telling you nothing but the truth. Only God can make this change. Okay. <laughs> Only God right. can make this change. People will not, no matter who, no matter how much money you have. For people who do not know San Francisco will not know what I'm talking about. You can Google corruption, ballot harvesting, missing ballot, San Francisco, you will see what I mean media reporter should be going after San Francisco election office. His name is John Ox, the director. I have been talking to him so many different times about inquire how many total voters active, how many unactive, how many actively ballot that you send it out. I've never got that answer. Do you understand the difference? You have a lot of voters in the row, but they are no longer alive. They no longer exist in San Francisco, but yet you continue to send this out. What happened to their ballot? Tell me about it. I am not the only one raising it up. I run for office and I got a lot of people saying the same thing. But the question is why we don't see it in the media is because the media part of it. That's why President Trump a lot of times say fake news. I've never paid attention until I run for mayor. Like, wow, it really. Yeah. Because, be, because that's what happened. Pray, vote in person. Yeah. So you obviously are very upfront about your religious inkling 
and your religious association, right? So I don't know if a lot of voters in San Francisco are religious to begin with, and even if they are, if a lot of them are Christians. So just as part of your campaign strategy, do you think that asking people to pray and to follow God and so forth will bring them to your side? Now, to answer your question, let me, let me say it this way. I'm not a religious person. I am a common sense person. I happen to read the Bible. I happen to be a Jesus follower, just like the people uh, follow Allah, follow Buddha, follow uh, Hindu, you know. I am a follower of Jesus, and it's also called Christian. I am not a religious person. That's the difference between a religious person and a follower of Jesus. I am a worker. I'm a social worker. The Bible teaches us to love people, all people, not just one person. I am a firm believer in prayer, and I am a firm believer about this nation. The United States was found by people who read the Bible, who believe in God. I am a firm believer and practice in humanity. I am not a religious person. I love all the people. That's what the Bible said. Everyone. Right. I mean, I think it's also sort of semantics, though, right? When you say you're not religious, but then you follow Jesus, some people think that, you know, that means you're religious. But I think you might be interpreting my religious as meaning that you're a religious fundamentalist, and then you dislike people of other religions. That's not what I'm implying. But anyway, my understanding is that housing is expensive because there's a lot of nimbyism that prevents building of new properties. When supply is constrained, the price shoots up. Is the current administration doing anything about it? And if you're the mayor, do you have a solution for something like this? So last year, we calculate approximately 50,000 empty apartments. This year, from the news, we have 20% vacancies. Vacancy, 20%, because people yeah. are sheltered in place. They no longer need housing in San Francisco. So I kind of, yes. So we calculate a minimum about 65,000 empty apartments right now, minimum, okay? So think about it, we only have less than 900,000 population. We had 65,000 empty apartments. Every apartment can host up to about six people, let's say an average six people, right? But how can we work with the landlord to release the empty housing? Now, that is exactly what I will be doing. So I will be developing a program between the property owners and the government and the renters who want housing. The reason that people kept the empty apartments refused to run it out because we have a lot of corrupted politicians work with the corrupted law firms to provide free legal services to residents. When they get free lawyers, they keep suing the property owners. So I spoke to a lot of landlords. I am a property owner myself, and I have been going to quite a number of court hearings with property owners being sued, property owners refuse to run it out. They rather keep it empty than give it out and risking about being sued. So when I become a mayor, the program will be no lawsuit for property owners. And anyone who do not like the property they're renting, they can have the right to switch to another property. They can have the right to file a complaint but it will not be a lawsuit unless it's illegal stuff, but like way like uh, selling me little drugs. So this way, the property owners will be able to release the, the property to run it to specialty teachers, and yeah. they don't have to travel so far away, you know, an hour, two hours to come to San Francisco. Right. It is work. a serious problem when yes. the provider of education cannot live locally. Yes. And the quality and of the education will go down. Let's move on to your personal life a little bit. So you came to America 30 years ago from China, right? Yeah, Can you, 34 years ago, yes. 34 years ago. Can you talk about your circumstance there? You, you came with your parents, right? What did your parents do? Where did you live? I came when I was a teenager. I was 16 years old when I came. So I was placed in high school and I did not know- Did you speak any of, English at all? No. I came with zero English. I came and I put in high school, I was in the ABC class. And I learn as I grow older. My parents are basic workers. My father and my mother, they both work in a, a sewing factory. That's all you can do as a seamstress. You know, that's all you can do with no English. And I worked as a seamstress myself when I first came. I lived in Chinatown when I first came. 
Yeah. I live I live uh, on Broadway between Grand and Stockton. So you know, in the heart of Chinatown, we did not have to worry about crimes. I did not remember we have homeless. Well, Ellen, thank you very much for coming on my show today. I learned a lot. Yeah. It's been a fascinating conversation. I you. think you're very brave for what you're doing, and I wish you the best of luck. Well, thank you. It's an honor to be interviewed. Yeah, God no bless、problem. your work and good luck to your Chinatown 2.0. <laughs> Thanks. Yes.、Now.